There we go. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Naomi Yang. I'm an assistant professor in the English department, uh, and uh, I am the founder of the Black Baroque Project. Uh, this is the first event of the Black Baroque Project for 2022, but not the last, and we are really happy uh, to get started again. Um, there, are, there is coffee, there are cookies behind you. Please help yourselves, don't hesitate. Rachel, we have some more people coming in. Uh, this event is being recorded, and the Zoom recording will be made available on the Black Baroque YouTube channel. This event is made possible by the generosity of the Division of the Humanities here in New Chicago, and we are very grateful to the Center for the Study of uh, Race, Politics, and Culture, especially Riley, uh, as well as Tracy Matthews and Tiara Kirkpatrick for co-sponsoring and hosting today's event. I cannot thank enough uh, Rachel Willis, who let in uh, most of you. In addition to being a brilliant PhD student in the English department, she's doing a masterful job at managing uh, the BDP. None of this would be possible without her. So thank you, Rachel. Uh, and last but not least, of course, I want to thank our distinct, distinguished guests, Kajal Benis and Cecilio M. Cooper, whom I will properly introduce in a minute. But first, I would like to say a few words about the Black Baroque Project. The Black Baroque Project was created in 2020. It will keep running for uh, another five years. And it platforms Black identifying contemporary artists who work with, against, and through Baroque aesthetics as they reckon with our own cultural moment. Last year, we hosted artists working in the medium of live performance. We had actor and director Keith Hamilton Cobb, actress Debrianne Bird, and choreographer and dancer Bintu Dembele. This year, we are turning our attention to visual artists. Uh, as I have said before, there is tension or a slash at the core of the phrase Black Baroque, because the Baroque is historically a time period that set the foundations for the white supremacist and anti-Black regimes in which we live today, with the development of settler colonialism, color-based slavery, and the transnational invention of whiteness. In visual and decorative culture, Baroque aesthetics yielded representations of Afro-diasporic people that often underlined their beauty, but also objectified and commodified them, as pre-modern critical race studies scholars like Kim F. Hall and Peter Erickson have showed in their work on Black and more figuration in early modern miniature jewels and aristocratic portraits. These are just two examples of such uh, early modern miniature jewels uh, that are thoroughly studied by Kim Hall in Things of Darkness. Actually, it is perhaps in visual culture that the early modern literal and symbolical commodification of the Black body was, that was becoming racialized is most palpable, most visible. And yet, there is simply no denying that Baroque aesthetic codes based on beautiful irregularity, characterized by complexity, surprise, dizzying falls, metamorphosis, illusions, perpetual movement, self-referentiality, and the lavish profusion of carefully contrived ornaments in a number of artistic media have appealed to and been reclaimed by artists of the African diaspora. Moreover, as we strive to reckon with this highly generative tension, the slash in the black slash baroque. We are hailed by French Caribbean and philosopher Edouard Glissant, an influential figure in black studies who thought about the baroque in his masterful poetic subrelation as an epistemology, as a mode of knowing and by extension of existing in the world that is radically open. And I'm going to uh, cite him at length here, but you can follow the quotation uh, on the screen. The baroque made its appearance in the West at a time when a particular idea of nature as harmonious, homogeneous, and thoroughly knowable was in force. Rationalism refined this conception, one convenient to its own increasing ambition to master reality. At the same time, the spectacle of nature was supposedly something one could reproduce. Knowledge and imitation set themselves up as mutual guarantors. The idea of imitation presupposed that beneath the appearance of things but basic to them, there lay the same depth, some indubitable truth, led to primarily by the sciences and more closely represented in art, to the extent that these representations systematize their reproductions of reality and recognize the legitimacy of its aesthetics. Thus, the revolution in perspective in paintings from the beginnings of the Quattrocento was conceived of as moving toward this depth. And this is where things get really relevant here. Against this tendency, 
A Baroque rerouting emerged and thrived. Baroque art was a reaction against the rationalist pretense of penetrating the mysteries of the known with one uniform and conclusive move. A Baroque shudder via this rerouting set out to convey that all knowledge is to come and that this is what makes it of value. Baroque techniques, moreover, would favor expansion over depth. This historically determined rerouting generated a new heroism in the approach to knowledge, a stubborn renouncement of any ambition to summarize the world's matter in sets of imitative harmonies that would approach some essence. Baroque art mustered bypasses, proliferation, spatial redundancy, anything that flouted the alleged unicity of the thing known and the knowing of it. Anything exalting quantity infinitely resumed and totality infinitely ongoing. The historical Baroque constituted thus a reaction against so-called natural order, naturally fixed as obvious fact. End of quotation. As a result, Edouard Lisson sees the Baroque as an epistemology that is not located historically as a one-time event in the, age, in the age of counter-reformation, but as a dialectical process that recurs transhistorically. All human culture, this is him, all human cultures have experienced a classicism, an age of dogmatic certitude, one that henceforth all must transcend together. And every culture at one time or another in its development has contrived Baroque disturbances against this certainty. I love this term, Baroque disturbances. And each transcendence of this certainty was prophesied and simultaneously made possible by means of these disturbances. This is poetic something of relation. That interpretation of Baroque culture and aesthetics might help us understand in what sense the Baroque constitutes a resource for contemporary artists. On the Black Baroque project, we want to hear from artists who reckon with the complexity of the slash, right, what Black slash Baroque means. And we curate conversations between such artists and scholars who are best positioned to help illuminate those artists' worlds for us. The scholar in question today is Cecilio M. Cooper. Cecilio M. Cooper is a Forsey postdoctoral research fellow with the University of Michigan's History of Art Department and an American Antiquarian Society hyphen National Endowment for the Humanities fellow. Previously, they have taught for English and Africana Studies at Tulane University, as well as the Center for Bioethics and Medical Humanities at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. Cooper is currently preparing their first book manuscript, which is tentatively titled South of Heaven, Surface, Territory, and the Black Ptonic. By engaging visual cultures of alchemy, demonology, cartography, and beyond, the book examines the occulted role blackness plays in cosmological constitutions of subsurface space from the 13th century onwards. Their research has been supported by such institutions as the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Antiquarian Society, the John Carter Brown Library, and Yale Center for British Art. And they have presented their scholarship at the American Studies Association, MLA, Brown, Princeton, McGill, University of Texas, Austin, King's College, London, among others. There is incredible range to their research, and this is a tantalizing book project. You will soon see why Cecilio is the perfect interlocutor for Kajal. Kajal. Through painting, Kajal resurrects objects that are lying dormant in historical archives. Kajal's portraits combine iconography from African, Asian, European, and pre Columbian traditions. He endlessly scours and sifts through books, online images, and visits museums in order to gather source materials. He takes these finds from his excavations and hybridizes entities that eventually become grandiose figures. Although the characters he constructs belong to a multiplicity of time periods, and you will see it's not just the Baroque, there's also Middle Ages, Antiquity, it's all in there, uh, locations and cultures, they foreground the forgotten past and reanimate minor artifacts of history into what amounts to a transformative assemblage. For Kajal, painting is a place where we can traverse different cultures and temporalities as a way to challenge our ideas about how we see ourselves and others. 
His work questions the boundaries of identity by treating painting as a site where radical mixtures, overlooked history, and speculative fiction come into play. And here I'm quoting him again. His paintings take us to a time before race existed by opening up to the chaos and complexity, expanding the periphery around how we perceive ourselves in the past and present day. The figures themselves, and you will see many today, are semi-fictional, composed of artifacts from history, yet in their totality, they do not represent figures from real history. As deeply invested in the artifact themselves and their respective history, Kajal is ultimately interested in how the combination of objects become a more accurate reflection of who we are. They transcend what confines or limits us in this reality and open us to the possibilities of who and what we can become. Kajal received his education from, uh, he got his uh, BFA from San Francisco State University, he studied in Florence uh, for, for a year, well, was for a year in Florence, and then an MFA uh, at Hunter College, New York. He's been the recipient of numerous awards and residencies, uh, the Lower East Side Friendship in New York, Joan Mitchell Center in New Orleans, Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptures Grant in New York. He's, uh, his work has been featured in exhibitions for over 10 years now in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Dallas, Miami, DC, Belgium, and Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, and the, some of those exhibitions have really evocative titles for our purposes. Just a couple of them, The Black Portrait, Beauty, Respect, and Mining Memory, 2020. He had his first solo exhibition exactly 10 years ago at the University of North Carolina. Uh, and since then, um, a bunch of them, Obscure Origins in 2017, Unearthed Identities also in 2017, I want to pay special attention to uh, the 2020 solo exhibition, Royal Spectre, uh, which took place here in Chicago at the Monique Menoche Gallery. Uh, Monique is not with, with us today, but uh, you saw her yesterday. I'm just going to cite an excerpt from the exhibition catalog for that uh, exhibition that I found particularly illuminating. Baroque images of the Blackamoor, We'll get there in a second. Baroque images of the Black and Moor are used by Kajal as source material, now reanimated through elegant paintings of warriors, scholars, scientists, and oracles, all rendered with painstaking detail and elevated to a grandiose status. Disconnected from their original historical context, these Black and Moor sculptures are reimagined through a hybridized narrative, creating fantasy paintings about a fantasy. They are reborn as theoretical rulers in a bygone era, with Kajal positioned as the appointed court painter of their mythical domain. And this is a metaphor to which you return uh, in, the, in, the, in the most uh, recent solo exhibition, the 2021 Tabula Raza exhibition at the Richard Keller Gallery in LA, uh, where, and here again, I'm, I'm reading from the catalog, you are taking on the endeavor as an artist commissioned by the highest court in the land, Kajal is tasked with painting a council of philosophical dignitary. dignitaries. Sorry. And at some point, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about uh, what it means for you to identify with the figure of the early modern court painter. Right? I'm going to go quiet in a minute uh, and yield the floor to Cecilio, who is much more competent than I am uh, to help us explore Kajal's world. But before I do, let me just explain uh, briefly the decision that informed the design of the poster uh, for uh, today's event. Well, the first conference I ever organized uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, we decided to put on the poster this painting on the left, 17th century painting by Dutch master Gobert Flink. We chose it because this portrait raises a number of questions about the intersection of portraiture, subjectivity, and Blackness in Baroque culture. If the portrait is the visual genre that is supposed to capture a person's subjectivity, then what does it mean that we cannot see this man's face? Are we to read it as an act through which the painter denied this Black man a subjectivity by representational means, or are we to read it as an act of fugitivity by which the possibly enslaved Afro-Dutch subject deliberately if subterraneously resists capture and surveillance. On the poster for today's events, we use the image on the right. 
um, we we decided uh, to use it's called it's silent incantation one, right? We decided to use this image where Kajal is citing, recirculating, or perhaps invoking through a secret incantation the Baroque idiom that is at work in Flake's work. And yet, on that image, you're not just citing it, you are uh, complicating it, further complicating the question of Black subjectivity. So I'm just going to take a look at, uh, at Silent's incantation here. While through the eminently Baroque motif of the Baroque, we can now finally see the Black man's face, which is so often the cornerstone of Western conceptualizations of subjectivity. At the same time, the man's enslaved condition is made explicit by the slave collar that he is wearing, as well as the texture of his skin that evokes the bronze of Baroque Blackamoor statues, framing him as an object, beautiful yet object nonetheless. The model is here again caught in the dialectic of the subject versus object that characterizes the Black Baroque. But in this case, you are directly implicating us in this line of questioning because the angle of the mirror suggests that we too are in part reflected here. So thank you all for joining us for today's conversation. I will yield the floor to Kajal and Cecilio. They will converse for about 40, 45 minutes, right? Uh, after which they will take uh, questions for about 30 minutes. And folks on Zoom, thanks for joining us. Don't hesitate to uh, ask questions in the, in the Q&A box. If the Q&A box doesn't work, just comments. We will read your questions and they shall be answered. Cecilia, whenever you need me to change images, just yeah. signal and I will Excellent. make it happen. Thank you so much. So I want to thank Noemi um, for that wonderful um, introduction and of course providing, providing some um, really rich context for, um, that allows us to um, really delve into Jal's work. Um, so I thought um, I really appreciate the opportunity to get to know you and learn some more about your practice, your orientation to Think about making images and engage its history and writing things. But I thought it'd be great for um, to provide us have an opportunity to learn some more about you. Um, so can you just begin by just telling us some more about um, your personal background, your educational training, and some of your professional experience? Yeah, I pro <clears throat> I'll probably start out by talking about my parents, and that's probably how I kind of got into all this. So <clears throat> uh, my father's from Belize. And he's sort of like, he would probably describe himself as a, as a Guardiite, but sort of Rasta Barre esque, uh, Guardiite esque, an artist, a musician uh, in his own right. Um, so that was uh, one figure that was an influence on my life. And then my mother is uh, an Italian American, Italian American origin. And prior to having me, uh, for seven years, uh, lived in Morocco. This is like a 60s, early 70s. Um, and it was prior to my father married to a Moroccan magician. And they traveled for years all over Northern Africa, Europe. Um, they went as far as I want to say Afghanistan and Nepal. And she was his assistant. So she was get like levitated and they, and they get chopped in half. And they even performed at the Taj Mahal, for example. Um, lived in India as well. So they after having all these experiences and coming from these different places, came together and had me. And, you know, in our house, uh, I had some of these, uh, I've heard stories about these travels and listened to music from, so it gave me a very globalized perspective. Um, although I did grow up in Santa Cruz, um, which is on, you know, on the West Coast of California. Um, so it was, it was the influence of her travels throughout North Africa and the Middle East and Europe and my father having this kind of like Garveyite, NOI <laughs> background all coming together. And that's probably what stimulated a lot of my like, curiosity early on. And, and I think what was what happened in, in hindsight is you know, I went to the public education system and they didn't talk about any of the stuff that I was sort of privy to as a child. And it made me kind of want to question, well, what is all this stuff that I was kind of hearing my, my parents talk about? Um, and later on, I, I went to San Francisco State for undergrad, and that's where I started painting, and I started to really delve into art history um, and, and focus my time on, on painting. And through my study of art history, I learned about how many artists from particularly the Renaissance period left where they were at and studied in Italy. 
So, okay, great. That's what I have to do. <laughs> so my senior year, I, I went and I studied abroad in, in Florence. And that really opened up my eyes to, it was like prior to was taking art history in, in a classroom, much like this, where we're just looking at slides of art, opposed to in Italy, you know, you're going to the Uffizi, you're going to the Palazzo Pizzi, Pizzi, you're seeing all of these images up front in person. And that, again, really kind of expanded my view. Yeah, this sounds like a really rich background, and I can see resonances in terms of the geographic expanse of maybe some of the places where you're going to um, kind of trend to venture and some of the way that you're in space and in your work. Um, and um, I'm also thinking about the, um, the, the uh, meshing of politics, about garbanism, and then also magic, and about esoteric things. Um, so I want to invite you to elaborate some more and tell us about how you think that um, has shaped your trajectory. Um, in terms of um, your kind of signature way of approaching um, making it. Yeah, I think it's in terms of like temporality, it, it, it allowed me to look outside of maybe the current paradigm. Okay. And um, uh, like spurred my fascination in different cultures that were outside of my own and um, time periods that weren't in close relationship to what I was dealing with now. And, and I do see my art as sort of porthole into another almost kind of like an idea of a metaverse mm -hmm. to a different creation of a different world. So I sort of want to escape the here and the now, a form of positive escapism, escape the here and now, kind of create a portal into another realm. Excellent. I'm thinking about a realm I'm seeing here, um, about this mirror image, um, which again shows up, shows up um, in terms of that kind of referentiality in terms of painting, um, we have a reference to a world of um, uh, on this culture. Um, can you tell us more about um, what are the different mediums that you're engaging? I know you're in Italy, there's certain things that we've done in terms of the great works, but I see painting, I see sculpture, I know you also in collage and photography. Can you tell us some more about just um, what elements um, that you kind of pull together? Yeah, I think that this is probably a good opportunity to talk about my creative process, yeah. which which really starts with doing research. And it's it's very loose. I would describe myself as a historian, but I'm doing research into various uh, points in time, and as I'm doing so, I'm collecting imagery that coincides with what I'm researching. So I might find imagery uh, via the internet. I might go to a bookshop and it's like pour through rare books. Um, obviously, going to museums is my favorite thing to do with sourcing imagery from the artifacts themselves. So that's led me on a, on a whole journey of, of different places in the world and going to different ethnographic museums. Uh, like I can think of one instance when I went to the uh, Anthropological Museum of Jalapa, Mexico, and there I think it houses like nine of the 19 colossal Olmec heads, for example. And just standing like face to face with these artifacts, it, it's there's like kind of an energy that these things have, and there's a different relationship when you're face to face via just seeing the vehicle. So, anyways, um, so I'm sourcing a lot of imagery. Uh, I have a historical archive that I've now been working with for about 10 years, and there's over 100,000 images mm -hmm. in that archive. Yeah. So I'm collecting images from wherever I can find them, and then I'm kind of carefully, it really, there's a, there's a vetting process that goes through, because there's a lot of hoax artifacts, there's a lot of art, uh, so just vetting them for, for their authenticity, I guess. And then I'm carefully organizing these artifacts into very specific folders. Um, and those folders pertain to maybe the, the angle at which the photograph is taken. Is this a bust? Is this a, a headdress? Um, is, is it a, a piece of jewelry that I could potentially use? And then from there, the collage process uh, happens. And that's where a lot of the magic happens in this process, where I'm layering images on top of each other, altering the opacity, like rotating, flipping, cutting. Um, trying to really come up with uh, co the combinations that again become like a, a, a sketch or a, a blueprint or maybe the best way to describe it is a jump off point for a painting um and that process i oftentimes bring up the analogy of like songwriting where sometimes the image is just i'm just like channeling and i just have to show up and be present and then the images find each other and it's it's paying attention to what's happening in that archive 
and what's what I'm seeing in front of myself because the combinations are oftentimes happening in my mind. I'll be looking at an image and then the, another image from the hundred thousand thousands of images will pop up and, and, and come together. So for example, I have some sketches that I've been sitting on for years now. And then sometimes I'll come up with a sketch in like two days. Like I really, I really feel like I have no control over it. So, um, and I, and that's where my studio looks like fairly pristine as far as like most painter studios go. Um, but my digital studio is a mess. I mean, if you looked at my desktop, there's just hundreds of images on there at, at all times. Um, it's, it's really hectic and, and chaotic, but out out of the chaos comes uh, these ideas. So from there, uh, once I, I'm like confident with, a, with an idea or a sketch, um, that becomes the impetus. I, I use the, the jump off point, the blueprint for pain, and then I'll, I'll use that as a guide point for pain. Okay. So when you're doing that process, um, do you employ digital technology as a, um, I know you sort things in paper cut type of way. Um, do you do digitally? Do you have other programs you use? Yeah, I, I use Photoshop. Okay. Yeah, so that's the computer program that I use. Um, I really, it's funny I should mention this, I really don't like working on the computer. Mm -hmm. um, there becomes a point where I have to get off that thing. I, I, I'm a, I love to paint. Um, I like the object um, of, of a painting versus like kind of a digital collage. Mm -hmm. I li I'd like to think that the painting renders the digital collage obsolete. Another metaphor I would use is, is a digital collage. It's almost like a roadmap. And I'm traveling from point A to point B. And on that journey, maybe part of the map gets ripped off or you know, I, 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 I let, uh, use a lighter and then part of the journey gets burned and I have to improv my way through, the, through, that, uh, through that journey to the destination point. Um, so it, it's, it's painting the thing is hard enough. So it helps to kind of somewhere, have some direction of, of where I'm going. Um, yeah. So next, more about scale. I saw there's a photo on your site, and when you're painting, they're like massive, like kind of the size of half of the wall, versus I'm sure you're using a computer screen. It's a, a small, um, how does scale affect? Um, I think that kind of there's another point I wanted to make that ties into the yeah. question you just asked me, but uh, also the fact that I'm using oil paint. And I'm using a lot of these really age-old traditions and text techniques that, that were used during the Baroque period, such as chiaroscuro and indirect methods of painting, um, really connected and ingratiated with the history of painting. So I don't see any disconnection between myself and my practice and those um, painters that came from the Baroque. I think if they were alive today, um, Caravaggio, Rubens, Veronese, you could they would be doing the same thing. Um, and it's funny because we brought up the uh, David Hockney secret knowledge and uh, that was an investigative case of, of how artists were using the most state-of-the-art technology at that time to aid in the, pra the technical practice of their work. So I think if they had Photoshop, they would definitely be using it. We're taking, we're taking. Um, that makes sense. Um, so you mentioned um, some of these um, Italian world artists um, where, um, what are there lineages in which you plot yourself in terms of other traditions of image makers, in terms of um, intellectuals, of people working on other kind of creative expression? Where do you situate yourself? Well, I mentioned that I, I feel very connected to them. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, Dadaism is collage. So there were a lot of uh, surrealism as well. So there's a lot of other histories of art that I do feel connected to, not just the Baroque. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's funny, like contemporary art today, you don't hear a lot of artists reference the Baroque. It seems uh, sort of outdated to some degree. Mm. Um, that's, how they, that's how they would do it, yeah. But there's no shame in connecting yourself to surrealism. You, know? you don't see tons of artists that are like, oh yeah, I'm a surrealist. But, but there's, you know, there's not that like, stigma around it, maybe is the word I use. Mm. Why do you think there's a stigma? I think it has to do with the, the subject matter. The, the kind of religious iconography and how art has become so secular today. Like academic art is looked at as a very kind of outdated. Whereas surrealism, I think, is is more maybe more suited to the contemporary world. 
Oh, I can turn it back. Maybe this is a great time to um, yes. see the slides. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Right, so this is like vision. Um, I'd like to hear more about how do you, um, I see the ideas around um, not only surrealism, but also speculative. Are you working in the fictional or the esoteric? Um, can you talk some about how that factors in um, dramatically in works like vacation? You know, I, I make the image and then I figure out what it is, why I did what I what I meant by it. Um, I like um, it's important for me that my paintings raise more questions. I think uh, good art raises questions that that doesn't necessarily answer them. Um, so with almost all my work, there's like kind of a riddle that I, I think is involved in it, where um, I'm. I'm not necessarily sure who this character is and necessarily what they're doing either. But I like to I like how the paintings make my imagination kind of run wild. And I like when the viewer steps to one of my paintings. It doesn't necessarily try to like categorize it or historicize it, but just lets their imagination kind of go crazy. Okay, one of my interests in looking at um, uh, just visual imagery from this particular early period. Um, it was about um, the iconography, it's about decoding. Um, certain kind of references that are not legible to everyone, um, and um, there's something secret or hidden about that. And so, think about libation offering potentially to ancestors um, that I think is working in the kind of the subtext of this. Um, also, the kind of uh, there's a meshing of the accoutrement in it um, references some of the studies and laboratories of some great thinkers of various traditions. But also, there's something different things that are happening with their figure in this particular image. Could you talk some about um, what other um, traditions you mentioned? All night, you put the Italians. What other things are happening here? I mean, I'm getting some of those. Yeah, well, Naomi brought up the, the black and white brooch. Mm -hmm. And the, the, this is a marvel. Face, so maybe I should also mention what you're seeing is a, a, a fusion of many images in my work. So, also within my creative process, I state sort of rules or laws that, that govern it. For example, um, each image is comprised of no less than three images. And I, I rarely include images that are of the same civilization. So they oftentimes come from different civilizations that are comprised to make the image. So oftentimes you can't necessarily tell where one um, image or artifact begins and the other, other ends. So for example, in this painting, uh, and I'm also incorporating etchings, engravings, painting, uh, photographs of, um, of artifacts. So I'm pulling all these things into a painting and trying to make it uh, at least feel like a convincing uh, image. An important uh, element for me and my work is, is bringing these images, to, bringing these figures to life, going into these historical archives and taking what's been lying dormant and like resuscitating and reanimating them. Um, to bring it back to the idea of oil painting, to me, oil painting is a metaphor for life. Um, there's life and energy in paint. Um, and again, that's what the digital, digital image doesn't have. So I want uh, you to feel that this is an image, this is a, a figure that's like sentient in that breeze, a breeze for example. Um, so yeah, they're, they're holding a, a libation cup with like some sort of red serum. And um, this painting comes from the, the show I did last year by Richard Heller called Tabula Rasa. And uh, they're holding a scroll and then there's an open book as well. So there's, yeah, like you said, a lot of accoutrements of... Yeah, I was just seeing you know, um, chemical study. Um, like, it's very serious of what the right is. It's like, uh, I appreciate that. Um, maybe we can go on to the next one. Um, so we have this particularly captivating Ocean Guardian. We were talking about how you employ landscape and space. We have um, representation of interior space and the domestic. Um, also, there's something you look very experienced with in terms of land, but also we have um, kind of a rare image of, of, of uh, aquatic oceanic sea. Um, unless you have time it's like a dinosaur. Um, there's a different palette happening here. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about what's happening? Part of it was moving back to the coast, moving okay. from New York, mm -hmm. which is like dense urban, back to like, you know, uh, a coastal town. I see, I see the ocean every day. That's had, I think, a profound impact on my work. Um, Probably this is a good time to talk about really how I see like the history of painting also the Baroque is through um, fiction and anachronisms. 
So uh, one of the things that inspired me uh, with this painting was the genre of the four continents, mm -hmm. where um, many artists uh, have depicted the four continents, Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas. And what I find so fascinating about this genre of work is how they depict Americans looking like Africans and Europeans looking like Asians and Africans looking still sort of like Africans, but I'm like, why? Wait, wait, what? And then they're riding like dinosaurs, like these really trippy figures that don't even exist from here. They're totally out of their imagination. Um, so again, when I see myself connected to the past, that's sort of uh, what I mean is it's, it's almost a, a reinterpretation of these paintings done in like 2022 of these kind of Blackmore-esque figures um, riding them. This is like what they, they, in the mind of the European back then, they never traveled to places as far as Africa. These were like totally mythical realms to them. They thought that this was possibly happening. Um, so again, this figure, there's probably like 12 different images that I used to, to create this image. Um, like for example, the headdress I got from a painting from Jean-Baptiste de Tiepolo. And this was a, one of his fresco paintings in Venice that kind of really caught the color of my dress. Um, so in terms of the color, I mean, I'm, I'm using uh, glazing mm -hmm. techniques. Mm -hmm. and glazing was uh, invented in around like 14, 1420s by Jan Van Eyck. And it's this, again, this process of an underpainting, kind of a monochromatic underpainting. And then you're layering thin, transparent uh, layers on top of that many layers. So that's how you're able to get these deep, rich colors uh, that you all kind of can't really get through uh, direct painting, which is like what I like to do about impressionism, for example. Is there anything we're missing in the sound impression? Is there a in terms of luster? Um, in the well, there's a lot of texture. Okay. Um, and that's another reason why I really like oil painting is it's so versatile and the textures and the surfaces that you're able to achieve uh, via oil painting, you're not able to really achieve in any other kind of medium. So you're, you're definitely missing out on that. And, and you mentioned scale earlier. This painting is you know, this right, seven by five and a half meters. It's, it's quite large. So you really have to like, step back and kind of think about it. Why is that important for you, this painting like scale? Well, um, scale can do two things. Like if it's a small painting, it really draws you into the piece. So it, it makes you kind of huddle around it and get very close to it. And if it's large, it does the opposite. It makes you want to stand back in order to look at the entire thing. So you can kind of play with your audience even depending on the scale of the thing. It's also the magnitude of the, of the image. Yeah, it makes me think about where um, a lot of the work imagery that we're familiar with, who are the intended audiences and where they would be typically displayed. And that's different, I might think. Do you have thoughts on that about who your intended audiences are? The difference between where you look at this like versus some type of audience. Not necessarily. Yeah, I'm pretty open to that. Okay. Um, excellent. Um, I know, I think what's really wonderful is that some of the things we're seeing with the advent of the internet, um, people were not able to see in person and experience it, but also you have upcoming shows. Um, when it's in a group show, it's contextualized in a certain way, but also, um, Bill, it's wonderful, it's a 10 year anniversary of your first summer show, and we have another one that's going to be coming up that we're going to get into. Um, yeah, I didn't realize that until you yeah. mentioned that. I was like, ten years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, can we talk some more about? Um, let's maybe move on to the next image. That'd be really great. Thank you so much. Mm. Yeah, this is a painting I made in 2016. It seems like a long time ago. Um, so the headpiece is actually from, it's, it's called a hacha, and it's made out of basalt rock uh, from the Olmec people again, Veracruz, Mexico. And uh, the bust is, was, had a fine spot in a, a town called Ruvo, Italy. It was probably made during the, the first, or, first or second century BC, it comes from Italy. And it's this sort of like pinkish, I don't know how faded colors got over time, but pinkish albino, like, uh, figure depicting an African. And I think the lower torso came from an Alexander Roslin painting, a Swedish, uh, Swiss painter. Anything you'd like to share about the fabric? 
Uh, I mean, I, I just, I like the combination of all the textures that, again, we have like Barak, excuse me, Barak, Basalt, Barak, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Basalt with the, what looks like a skin color, but really is a, is a plaster bust. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, all the textures of the fabric, uh, just in combination, I thought made for a striking image. Yeah, I'm seeing embroidery and you talked some about um, the beginning and ends of the silk road. I'm going to go to another panel and talk about. So I just see uh, just material, mm -hmm. um, different kinds of um, things in a single image. Um, and I, the juxtaposition of the two kind of head faces and opposite profile, mm -hmm. signaling east and west. There's just a lot of things that happen. Jet yeah, form, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really great. Um, do you have anything you want to share with us about um, how you deal with temporality and space, like in, in in a broad way about we talked about anachronism, we mm -hmm. talked about um, um, um we were talking about uh, the pieces about layering, cutting, and flipping. I think um is a reference to your method. Can you speak some more about like the stand space here? What else are you doing with the ground? It's almost like every painting becomes it's almost like an accident. Okay. Right, like when I'm coming up with these combinations, it, it almost like they almost catch me off guard every time. I'm like, oh, whoa, or sometimes I don't even catch it at first. I almost thought it was a mistake, and then I just toss it off to the side. And then I'll look at it two days later and I was like, oh, well, that was pretty good, <laughs> you know. Um, so you mentioned something else that went off on a little bit, of it's, okay. Tangent, but, it's okay, it's but okay. But you mentioned temporality, yeah. yeah. So maybe we could we could talk about that. I might we might be getting ahead of ourselves slightly, but. Again, I mean, we're, we're, we're all, all the three of us are really interested in, in like the deep past. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a dis, kind of a disconnection, but I'm interested in how these objects come back to us through space and time. And we have this like 21st century lens that we view um, you know, the world politically through that wasn't how it was back then. So oftentimes we super, the term is called presentism, but we superimpose our current view of, of like, let's just say in this case, racial relations. And, and we superimpose them onto the past, but that's not, they didn't see, the, the, the ancient world didn't see itself through how we racial relations now. You mentioned how in the Baroque, how the way we see race now is sort of formed to some degree at that period of time. We're talking about the 1600s, 1700s, the the Enlightenment. Um, but we were talking about earlier how the term black didn't necessarily exist in the medieval and uh, the Hellenistic world, for example. Terms like atheia, for example, meant was were used for black people. Atheot meant burnt faced people. Um, it wasn't a, necessarily a derogatory term, but it was a used term for others. Even the term Moorish, for example, we were saying, the Moors didn't call themselves Moors. They would call themselves the Almoravid dynasty or the Almohad dynasty, for example. So it's interesting how things could change based off of who's viewing who and at what time period we're looking back on, on it. Uh, then. I wanted to maybe bring up the Manila collection, but I don't want yeah, to like go too much of a, of a let's go for okay, it. let's go for it. So I mentioned earlier in, the, in my life how I kind of got interested in these topics. Later on, I, I maybe around the time of grad school, so we're talking 2009, I came across the Manila, the, the multi-volume series book, The Image of the Black in Western Art. What I learned through uh, The Image of the Black in Western Art is this, pro this, this project of dealing with uh, people of color from antiquity goes back very far. It goes back to the mid 1800s. And there was a, a German uh, scholar, I'm not gonna try to pronounce his name, so I'm gonna put it But he was collecting images of artifacts from antiquity to, this was during the, the abolitionist movement in slavery. Uh, to potentially harken back to a more optimistic uh, period of time of, of racial relations. Um, the second generation of, of people who were dealing with this were Elaine Locke and Grace Hadsley Beer. Elaine Locke wrote the Negro, he was a Rhodes Scholar, well, the first, I think, Harvard Rhodes Scholar. Um, and he was looking at these um, artifacts as well. And there's sort of a, a connection to what Cubism, uh, what Cubism did in terms of ex expand, particularly the minds of Europeans to the beauty of so-called so primitive art um, and how that opened up um, the minds of Europe to primitive and tribal art and how they in, in it basically birthed modern, modern art, I mean, let's be real. Um, 
if you look at Picasso's work, right? But there was also something happening with this, with, with this, uh, with these artifacts as well. So you had Elaine Locke and his collection and his writing on these artifacts. And then you had Dominique Van de Mille, who was collecting these artifacts during the Jim Crow era to counter anti-Black racism, to say, hey, look, it's in stark uh, contrast to the Jim Crow era and the imaging of Black people during the Jim Crow era, to say, hey, look, these positive images, some of them were positive so, uh, images of Black people from the past, could potentially point to uh, mending racial relationship, racial relations in the now. So, it, it blew my mind to realize how far back people were looking at these images and, and talking about this and how I almost see myself now as like the fourth generation of this project. And I think there's no better way to, to in, incorporate these images into a fiction. Because again, this isn't, we're sort of ignoring chronology in a lot of ways and we're mashing up cultures and like you mentioned radical mixtures. Um, you know, what do we do with it now? You know, so I think incorporating an art in art is the perfect thing to, to do with it. Okay, so I'm sensing two like feral lines about again, um, you're modest about this, but about um, kind of executing some kind of formal, um, some techniques formally, um, this doing certain kind of work, but also in the background, you're making a comment on um, some other things. Could you share with us what do you think it is that people misunderstand most about? your work, your post. I think, yeah, my work gets like politicized in two directions. I think some people come to my work and they say, okay, this, he, this is um, like a criticism of the canon. He's talking about how these, um, I think a lot of people get it wrong when they say like um, the black moors and images of people of color from antiquity were framed in the lens through racism. I don't think a lot of them were racist. racist. Like if you go back even to the first image um, of the silent incantation painting, that was a bust made by Charles Cordier, um, part of like the Orientalist movement, right? And if these images were depicting like slaves and, um, and so on, or, or impoverished people maybe, then why are they wearing uh, like turbans bedecked in jewels, and why are they made out of some of the most precious objects and materials that existed? Um, why were they so heavily sought after? Why were they made with such precious care and detail? Um, so to me, um, that's where I derive like a form of empowerment from these objects. I'm like, oh my God, these are some of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. So, so to kind of wrap it up, in one direction, I think people will, will kind of say, oh, this is a criticism of the canon, like look at how racist these artists, European artists were to depict this, so on and so forth. And then I, I bring presentism back into the equation. The other is, um, it, it kind of deals with this whole movement of like kind of retconning history, like, oh, we were the original like kings of Europe, <laughs> like we ruled Europe, it wasn't really like it. Henry the Eighth. It was like so. I think people will like go in either direction, and I think uh, if it, it's totally fine to derive again like some notion of empowerment through the work I do myself. Um, but I think um, there's no ideological bend with my work. There's no uh, agenda in that sense. I'm not trying to rewrite the past. It's almost more of an homage to the past than. A, a, a recontextualization of it. So I stepped to history with like a very open mind. Um, and uh, I, I had fun with it. I appreciate your vision on the question. Um, you've given us a lot of, um, they were just visually stunning images to uh, just um, behold. Um, and um, I think this is a great time now to shift towards some of your um, forthcoming or works in progress. Sure. Um, can we get to the next thing? Thank you so much. Um, so um, what I understand is this is part of your um, project you're currently working on, Nice Park History. Mm -hmm. And again, it represents some of your um, kind of the corrections, revisions, um, interventions that you're seeking. Can you um, say how that percolates you? So first of all, this is a work in progress. It's not yeah. finished. <laughs> um, it's probably like 80% there, but as I was mentioning earlier, I started this painting in November. So I work on a bunch of different paintings at the time. I'm doing like 10 paintings right now. But um, it's been great to really, I, 
I've always used this uh, analogy. I think I heard it from Cezanne, where it's as artists, we don't finish paintings, we abandon them. Mm -hmm. People always ask, when does when do you know a painting's done? So I've actually really been challenging that notion and like not abandoning any, any work. Like, not that I would abandon it, but there's a time when you have to just like, you can pick the thing forever. Mm -hmm. you know, you really so I've been really like taking a lot more time with my work. Um, so iceberg history. Um, that's it, it's a term that I, I came up with that I'm using as sort of a catch all phrase for this history that we've been discussing. And I use the metaphor for an ice of, of an iceberg in the sense that the history that at least we focus on here in America, uh, what's visible uh, from what let's say the bust up is, I would say, the last 400 years. Um, and that history is rooted in upheaval and bound in the narrative of oppression. Um, what about all this history we've been talking about? What about what led up to uh, slavery, colonization, and so forth? I'm, I'm interested in what led up to that. I'm interested in, in investigating all of this history that I feel has been swept under the rug, overlooked, and even recently discovered. Um, and the reason why I, I use it as a, a metaphor of an iceberg, one, because it, it's kind of hidden, and two, the depth to it goes back thousands of years. Um, I think like we mentioned in the conversation we had, if, if we focused on the last 400 years and we looked at that as like um, as a 12-year calendar, it would be like if we focused our history just in the month of December, we would <laughs> leave out the other 11 months of the year, and you're, you're missing out on such a, a rich uh, and deep context that explains so much that um, I think would really change the way that people saw not only themselves, but the world. Just for an example, you know, during Europe's dark age, that was a Christ, maybe a Christian dark age, but it was really an Islamic European golden age that lasted almost a thousand years and really spurred the Renaissance movement. Why wasn't I talking about that in school, <laughs> right? Um, so that's just a small example of, of what, you know, at least the three of us are aware of. And I think it's really changed the way that we uh, approach not only like the realm of, of history and theater and uh, the occult and uh, alchemy and, and so on and so forth. So this is a, a project that I'm working on now. I'm making a, a couple of these paintings. Um, and this bus was well, kind of a, a, fusion, a fusion of a couple of different images, but the face itself comes from, I want to say like the third century BC from the Mediterranean area. And it's a depiction of an African. So um, uh, thank you so much for the preview. Um, if we wanted to see complete versions um, in this series, I uh, actually have an upcoming show. Where would we go see them? So this, you can see this painting. You know, it is done at Monique Baloch Gallery that's here in Chicago. And it'll be in November. Excellent. I'm sure I'm not alone and I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, I think this is a good time to shift towards Q&A. Um, so is there any other questions from Zoom or from the audience? I'm happy to get started with a question sure. and help people collect their thoughts. And I'm sure folks on, yeah. on Zoom as well have questions. But uh, my question is for you, Cecilio, actually, as a you know, specialist of the Black Tonic, right? And the, the occult, the Saturnias, the surface. Um, you know, we, we if, it's not just me. I think we all do that, right? We have those interests. We have those concepts we're deeply invested in and have been thinking about for a long time. And then we encounter artworks, fascinating, stunning artworks, and we kind of, they, they speak to those interests. And so I'd be curious to hear when you look at Kajal's work, how does that connect to this, this uh, you know, deep conceptual network that you're working with? I appreciate that. Um, so some of my, um, when I'm thinking about my work around the Black Phonic, or Phonic, race um, pronunciations, um, so a Greco-Roman term just signaling just subsurface space, which is interesting about it. And I again think about this image is that it includes both subterranean space, but also some aquatic space. So in some ways it's a geographic marker, but also thonic is also something that is cosmological or religious in nature. Thonic is again the subsurface space off of references, things like hell, evil, um, or just underground spaces for rhizomes, um, um roots, um uh caves, where maybe be um, some kind of um, burrowing animals live. So phonic means lots of things, but also when I think about the phonic, phonic 
I think about deep time, mm -hmm. about what kinds of narratives are made about time, um, long durée projects, and particularly as someone, I work in art history, or I work in histories of science and medicine, as well as histories of art, but also my orientation is um, transdisciplinary um, in nature. And so I look for resonances and themes, and also trying to trouble methodologically how we approach those topics. So I, in some ways, when I look at images, I don't think it's, um, I don't think the anachronism is a problem, but I know it is for certain kinds of approaches um, to art history, orthodox approaches to art history proper. Um, so when I'm looking at it, I, where I would say like we, there are overlaps for our, our approaches to work, but you know, I think productive tensions. And so, for example, when I'm looking at, when I think about the thonic of the subterranean, I look at images of like, um, for example, I look at alchemical imagery. There are representations of blackness and black people in them, but they've just been overlooked. And during this time period, I think because they don't fit a certain kind of narrative about um, maybe about harmony or the political nature, or, you know, one of the things I'm looking at the tension between racial and non-racial, that the, I think that the, um, the, the distinction between the two is, um, um, can't, is untenable at this point, particularly because, not because they didn't, the blackness did not mean something, never meant something non-racial then, but that is not possible for us at this moment to ever look back at that moment and not have that kind of lens on it, because I think it's very much motivating, particularly in our history, when there's a dearth of actually black art historians specializing in anything, or also just a dearth, you can write about representation of black people and it not be about race, and we've seen that um, in productive ways. But I think what's interesting is about um, when you're speculating on work, I think the idea that you're pulling in geographic regions, like, like for example, the idea that everything that Black people um, or oppressed peoples of color, um, non-Black persons, was always about orientation to whiteness. What happens when you put these images from different traditions together in an image? What, what does that Janet's face do um, that you have? I think it's in um, Baroque um, icon one. Yeah. Yeah. Baroque classic. Thank you, the Baroque, Baroque classic. What's happening there versus um, kind of um, the way and I'm also um, very interested in what you're doing in perspective about um, there's something about when the viewers, when the viewers, the figure's gaze does not meet the viewer. Um, um, when it's about being um, fetishized, it's about a kind of scope of feeling gaze versus when the, ver the gaze is averted. Sometimes it's about, and you mentioned Gustav, about a kind of opacity or denial, um, a kind of self referentiality when I think about mirrors and symmetry. So I think there are all these kind of complicated things. And I totally get that. I appreciate, because some things you said about people misunderstood, it's interesting about how I, how I approach your work or how I think about our other people too. And so I think it makes um, a good opportunity to think about, for those of us who are very materially concerned, but also think about the speculative, um, what kinds of conversations can we have um, among um, among um, black descended, black derived persons, there's not necessarily about always being de defensive. Um, I, I appreciate having debates among ourselves mm -hmm. as well as outside. So thank you for the question. I can just piggyback really quickly. Sure. I mean, I have nothing to say, but I have an image yeah. that I think is connected <clears throat> to the point you were making in yeah. Sicilio yeah, that I added because it was so gorgeous. This one uh, from Kajal's website, Candid of Curiosity. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, this is the most early modern thing Baroque thing there is, right? You <laughs> curiosity. Uh, right, right. But what is striking to me is the taxonomy, separation, mm -hmm. right? Each object mm -hmm. is from a different culture is fetishized, but put in its separate box. Mm -hmm. And what you do here is the opposite, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mash it all together. And that's really foundational as you for you. So it's, it's a push and pull. You, right? you know what actually got really at another, I, I should mention this earlier, but one of the things that also got me on this whole kick. Um, of, of putting different civilizations together that probably maybe previously didn't have an interaction with each other or possibly did this gives in the speculative realm. We can talk about that. That made me think of another story. But I want to, I took a class when I was in, in grad school at Hunter and it was a curatorial class. And the teacher said, if you want to like curate a show, I'm going to make it short, but if you want to curate a show, you can, you can include any works of art you want to include into the show. It can be like a total fantasy show. And I was the only person that like went back into the ancient zone time and did that. But I, so the project was going into the Met and just curating a show around different objects that I could pull from anywhere I wanted to throughout the Met. This was also at the time when I discovered Fred Wilson's work. And what, what Fred Wilson was doing was going into museums and repurposing objects so that they told a different story. And, I, and it just clicked in my head when I saw that. 
Um, so I, I also started to, to start to do research into history. And you know, you walk into a museum, and I understand how architecture works. You have to like organize things in somewhat of a way when you step into a museum. But like the Greco world, the world's over here, the Egyptian world's over here, the Semitic world's over here, the Asian world's over here. So when you step into a museum, because of how things are organized, it, it makes it seem like these cultures didn't interact with each other, appropriate from, from each other, and influence influence each other. And my research told me that, in fact, they absolutely did. And, and you mentioned just a minute ago, made me think of Black Athena, for example. And that's exactly kind of to a degree what Black Athena covers partially. Um, so I thought, well, why don't I just mash all this stuff up? And it can tell a different story that I think is more accurate than the story that the museum tells by, by segregating. So let's not segregate history, let's integrate history and then t tell the story about that integration. It, it, not to get on too much attention, but and you also made me think of, of combining the kind of African with the pre-Columbian, which made me think of Ivan Van Sertema before Columbus, and how he's proposing that Africans were coming over here to the New World prior to Columbus to, to reconnect with their long-lost ancestors, the Olmec. I'm, I'm kind of laughing what I'm saying, and you can maybe tell how I, what I think about it. But I think that's so, just the fantasy of it, the, the, the fanciful encounter of these civilization, particularly non-European civilizations, outside of that realm of colonization, et cetera, is really, really gets my imagination just going crazy. And I, I, I love that. I can keep speaking, but I don't know if there are any questions. <laughs> Do we have questions? Okay, I'll keep talking about that. <clears throat> Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. Um, yeah, so one of the things I'm glad, I mean, um, the Kevin of okay. Curiosities is really Excellent. I also think about just like spatial, like how are these ideas around the way race or differences visualize how that is oriented spatially? And one is I think about the literal, you talked about the segregated spaces in the museum. I think specifically about the British Museum, about how the African artifacts um, were held off site for uh, 100 years or so after um, the, the first public museum's inception. And then when it gets moved, it's literally put in the basement. Of the, of the building. Um, and so when I think about the product too, I think about the idea of when what Black people, the association between Blackness and Black people as being um, underground, as being relegated to being unimportant, um, as kind of an afterthought. Also thinking about the Underground Railroad, about the space of flight, um, um, including surveillance, but also thinking about Blackness as like the ground of reference, referentiality, as opposed to an external imposition. If that is taken, so if we think about um, Blackness or Black people in Africanity as a way of grounding the conversation, then what is a, the cabinet of curiosity is a kind of ordering, um, kind of way of object that is resonant with Carl Mason's way of ordering plants and peoples and kind of a kind of universal system that we still use, homo sapiens, we still, um, the way the two part name system we still use today and we try to disentangle from the racist elements of it. But the idea of like you, you orienting that cabinet of curiosity in a particular way, who's looking at it, what's in it, um, what is it systematizing, what is the order, um, uh, is how violent is it, what is verticality doing there, and I'm not sensing a kind of way that you're, you seem disinterested in hierarchy, but you're still playing with verticality in space in a particular kind of way, and I think that's interesting to think about, because part of me is just like, those are just fraught orientations, formal elements that you can't, you know, you can't escape from, but you know, maybe there's, there's something like that. There's actually a question in the Q&A that I think is, is connected to what you're uh, saying, Cecilia. This is a question for uh, both speakers. Is there any art collection, museum, or book that uh, you would like to have the chance to remake, reorganize through the lens of the Black Baroque? This is an organization. I think by your filing system for which sounds really amazing um, for your other images. Yeah, rephrase the question again. Sure. Just kind of it again. Is there any art collection, and that can be a museum or a book, that you would like to have the chance to remake, reorganize through the lens of the Black Baroque? All of them. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> Give me it all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, the most exciting thing for me is when I discover a new artifact that I, I can use. It. Like, that That makes my day, makes my week. If I come up with, like, a, a, I call it a level 10 artifact. 
fact. <laughs> I mean, I'm always on the hunt for the rare, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, when I come discover a new bust, I'm just like, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> And it, it just makes me wonder, like, what else is out there? You know, like, one of the one of the best experiences I ever had was so with the image of the black archive, the image of the black in Western art. There's it's an archive consisting of forty five thousand images, mm -hmm. and half of the digital archive, the digital archive is housed at the Warburg Institute in London with the W. E. B. Hutchinson's Institute at Harvard. I might have butchered that a little bit. So I was in London some years ago, and I just like bullied my way into the arc into their archive. I like showed up. You need like all these access this and access that. I was like, yo, I'm an artist. This is my work. I'm really interested in this. Like, you have to go let me up and look at this archive. Mm -hmm. So I went up there, and there's just files and files of images, and I'm like blowing the dust off these things, and I'm just taking pants. And I was just blown away. I, had, I came back the next day because it was so, I didn't even get to get through a fraction of it. And like, go oh mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was just incredible. So what would you change if you were to reorganize that? I don't understand the question of reorganize. I mean, I think this is, this is it, right? What, what, what do they mean by reorganize? What do you think they mean by reorganizing? Well, I mean, you reference in terms of you you organize things by, I mean, the profile or the angle of the bust, mm -hmm. um, and that is a nuance. A library would do something differently, or a curator would organize things differently. So your mind is working to that type of way. Yeah. How, yeah. Do you, how would you cluster them? I mean, I, the reason why I'm clustering the organizing and reorganizing is just that when I go to collage things together, like it's a different mindset than my organizational mindset. Um, so the, the cleaner and organized that, that my files are, which are insane, um, just makes for a smooth process. Because I'm like, like, oh, where's that one image? And okay, it's not over here. I can just kind of access it easier. But yeah, they're two totally different like, modes of thinking. Organization, vetting, searching, mm -hmm. hunting, blocking. And as a follow-up, might you be interested in some point at making your own archive the way it is structured and organized, <laughs> you know, following the way your framework? Might you be interested in some point at Probably, making yeah. that? I mean, I'm not going to be able to use all these images, mm -hmm. you know, like that, I, that I've collected, which is mm -hmm. kind of like crazy to think about, but. But maybe it'll be a resource down the line. Yeah, yeah, it probably will. Yeah, like, it's something that will live on. Yeah. A question about um, when you decide to use an image in your work, are you finished with it once it makes its appearance? Will it resurface in another word? Good question. Yeah, no, when I use an image, I don't use it yet. And then, so I really have to have like a level of certainty with the, the object or with the painting. Mm -hmm. I have to be sure that I'm using it in the right way. Mm -hmm. So. We have a, sorry, I don't want to. Another question in the, in the Q&A is, thank you so much for this art gorgeous art and for this fascinating conversation i have literally a dozen questions but i will limit to myself to one do you think that there is any way your father's garveism influenced your sense of history and aesthetics yeah probably on a more subconscious level for sure yeah i, I can't like pinpoint how or or why but definitely absolutely mm -hmm. like i'll talk to him and i'll say yeah when we were a kid i used to like have this on in the background or it'll be, you know like a uh, Fire con speech in the background. I'm like, what? I was sitting at that when I was like four. <laughs> so I'm sure somewhere it's still it's still it's still there. Yeah. You guys want to be listening to music and anything? Oh my god, absolutely. Yeah. I listen to a lot of history lectures too, music and history lectures. Yeah, a ton. Yeah, yeah I'm studying cool. while I'm working. Oh. That's that's just like a you know, like YouTube changed everything, you know, like in, in 2009, when I entered grad school, that's kind of when YouTube really like hit the scene, and I was able to really open things up on the internet. It kind of exploded more so. so yeah. History lectures. <laughs> well, <Wow. laughs> that's why it's all like to listen to while you're painting. Oh, yeah, well, right. yeah. I'm not like sitting there taking notes and like retaining <laughs> things. But, like, yeah. <laughs> Let me respond to this right now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for asking the questions. So, yeah. um, do we have more questions in the room? Because I have one, but I don't mm -hmm. want to monopolize the. 
I have another. I'm just thinking about, um, you know, you find these images and there's probably a, an orientation because it's two dimensional archival photo of sculpture. But he's thinking about like maybe what's on the other side of that headpiece or um, bust, like, because you're thinking about orientation. So I'm looking at this, I guess, mask headdress. I'm thinking about what the other side might look like. And are you um, making exact replicas or are you kind of dreaming about what the versa side might look like and then incorporating that in any way? Well, like with the silent incantation painting, um, that was uh, multiple photographs of the same bus. So I found the, the image of it from the, the front and then the back. So I oftentimes are able to find images from multiple sides. Uh, multiple angles of the same object. So playing around with that is something that, but in terms of like, we're trying to like recreate what that unseen side is, it's not something that I- Maybe do. with the icebergs. I'm just thinking of all kind of like, what is beneath, beneath the surface or mm -hmm. behind the work that we're not seeing, so. Um, mm -hmm. it's something to think about, yeah. I know that the digital collage is a part of your process with associate projects, but do you ever think that maybe in the future you will have, I don't know, maybe a publication of the making of? Because, mm -hmm. like, just thinking that, like, there's this whole other artistic version out there of these wonderful paintings that you have. Like, I want to see what that looks like in a choppy, you know, photographic, you know, collage. And I'm wondering if you ever think that you might do something along the line where we can see if those work. <clears throat> My initial reaction is like, no, my, my initial feeling is to like keep it hidden. I think I mentioned that I like, think I read it in obsolete. So I, I almost mm -hmm. feel like it would diminish the value of the painting, gotcha. but I'm sure like giving, I, I know people like to see insight into the process and kind of how the things made. Um, but it's something I've always kept like pretty private. Mm -hmm. I got some questions. Yes, sir. As you look at your practice, um, for a while, what do you think the next evolution of the target? Where are you going to push yourself next? Well, you saw the painting that I'm working on now. That's sort of the scene. You mentioned a subterranea, and I'm actually also painting these like ocean dweller, these figures that are in like coral reefs. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of bronze uh, busts and oil lamps and things like that. And they look like they've been kind of aged by, by not only time, but by like, the salt water and so on. So. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure where the work, work will go, but I like the idea that I'm not 100% sure. But I mean, I, I'm always pushing it. I, again, I always want to like kind of surprise and challenge myself. So, so we'll see. I have a lot of ideas and I feel like I don't have a lot of time, which is a good <laughs> problem to have. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. I have another question about time actually, which is about, um, the place of the future and in the way you engage with history and another image I had added on the PowerPoint that's it's quite striking is this one which uh, yeah. actually uh Soyo when you said you, you, that you're interested in encoding I was like <laughs> it's there <laughs> um, but yeah it's quite striking um oh, and what, yeah, I mean what 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 it stands out to me is this idea of technology science that is resonant with futurity right and yeah, and yeah. almost um, you know, it sounds like, okay, my question is not super articulate, but hopefully, <laughs> no, you, you'll be able to, to, to follow it. Um, I'm thinking Afrofuturism, right, versus Black Baroque. I'm mm -hmm. thinking mm -hmm. speculation, you're interested in speculation, using it as a technique, it's, it's so crucial to you, and that's also a crucial element for Afrofuturism and imagining other Black futures, right? So I'm wondering what how you see what what is the place of the future is it in your thinking is there a way in which oddly enough you're turning to the past as also a turning to the future yeah i would say i would say so i was thinking about kind of quantum well, quantum mechanics or quantum uh, science in relation to uh, a lot of like tribal um, like tribal aesthetics but uh, what's the word not methodologies, but there's a connection between, um, I think a lot of indigenous cultures uh, and, their, and their use of um, alternate realities or, or altered states of consciousness 
and that relationship to what a lot of these quantum scientists are like discovering. And I think they already had it all figured out. <laughs> and quantum uh, science, I don't want to say what is right. Quantum science is kind of catching up to what we've already known for thousands of years. They're just you know proving it through numbers. So I thought scarification um, was like this form of, of quantum, uh, visual form of quantum. And then the, the, the literal science equation. So, like, there's the kind of connection between the two. Yeah, I get that. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I get, I get the term Afrofuturism thrown at me, or not thrown at me, but at, are you, John, are you Afrofuturist? And I, I've, never, I've never seen myself as that. Um, but I am like, I think I really relate to like Octavia Butler and Sun Ra in the sense that they never they didn't describe themselves as Afrofuturism. It was a term that got like I think Mark Derry turned in like the early 90s and it got kind of thrown on to them. And I, I sort of feel that same way. Um in terms of like the future, I am interested in how, what identity will human identity will look like in the future, what our identity will look like in the future. And I think that is that like idea of going back to the past to Glean some sort of insight into the future. There are no futures. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm wondering what is the highest compliment you've received as an artist? And so to clarify, I, I know you've got you've had in public spaces, so you've been written about or reviews. And I'm wondering if there are any words that you've ever seen about your work from someone who has consumed it. That that made you think like oh they got it or like if I, you, I if only I could live up to that mm -hmm. how you see me. You know, I was thinking about this earlier today. Actually, it's funny you asked that. Um, so I used to have a studio in like on the Bushwick Bed Stuy border, uh, in New York, and it was a storefront property. It was just right on the ground, so there were like two big doors that opened up. And I would just it was just you know a neighborhood or whatever, and I would just I would keep my the doors open so people would just come into my studio sometimes, and I would just let them like they, they could it could have been anybody, but I, I didn't I didn't mind it like I liked the reaction people got when they walked in and saw these paintings on the wall, right? So this to answer your question, this uh, mother and daughter came into my studio. The daughter she must have been four or five years old. She just walks around. She looks at all the paintings. She pauses for a minute and then she goes, look, mom, these are spirits. And then just walks up. <laughs> but I'm like, this five-year-old girl, she got it. She didn't, she didn't need to read uh, this dense academic text. She didn't need to like have any understanding of, of art history or the contemporary art market. She walked in, she saw it, it and she got it. And, and that was to me probably like the coolest thing that I think anybody ever said. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> All right. Do we have any? Maybe we have time for one final question. If if someone wants to ask, I think we can end on that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. we cannot top that. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you, Cecilia. Yeah, thank you. Good job. Just a great launch for the 2022 season of Black Grove Project. So please stay tuned, but we'll have another project. We don't have a date yet, but it will be by the end of this month, another conversation around the Black Baroque as a project between artist Wally Lekunju and art historian Lia Markey. Um, so stay tuned and please feel free to hang around for a little while.